Good morning. I, I have the joy this morning of ministering the word. If you don't know who I am, my name is Justin. I am one of the leaders uh, and serve as a pastor within this church. So it is really good uh, to have you with us this morning for the first time visitors. It is really good as well if you are joining us. Can I please ask, can we have the lights up? I would like to see the faces um, whom I'm speaking to. It's a bit dark, so I don't really see people's faces. Um, can we just make sure that the lights are a bit brighter? I would appreciate that. Um, that's good. A um, bit, bit more brighter. I want to see the faces. I want to I see, I want to see you guys. I want to see, <laughs> I want to see you guys. Okay, good morning. So, yeah, for you joining us for the first time, really good. I love the, the just the testimony around small groups. Uh, I visited um, a young adult just get together, and it was so really amazing just being with you guys. It is, it is amazing what God's doing within our church and just in our midst. So, but without further ado, I'm going to turn to the Word of God, and I'm going to be turning to the book of Hadassah. Does anybody know where do we find the book of Hadassah? I can't hear you. Esther, aha, uh -huh. the, the pastors here in front are saying, no, there's no book like Hadassah. <laughs> okay, um, I'm calling the sermon, I'm reading from the book of Esther, and I'm going to be taking out, um, out of three chapters. So I'm looking at two verses from each chapter. And I'm going to be looking at three things when I'm looking at the book of Esther. Um, I'll tell you now. So I'm looking at Esther 1. Verses 10 to 12, Esther 3, verses 5 to 6, and I'm reading from the ESV. And then Esther 4, verses 13 to 14. Okay, so let's, let's read the Word of God together, and I'm reading from the ESV. And some of these names in this first chapter is quite difficult to pronounce, but I'll, I'll do my best. And I'm reading from verses 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Miuman, Bitsa, Harbona, Bichtha and Abachtha, Zetha and Karkas, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king Azurias, to bring king, or rather to bring queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the people and the princess her beauty. For she was lovely to look at, but queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Esther 3, verses 5 to 6. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay his hands on Mordecai. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, that's the king. Esther 4, verses 13 to 14. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all of the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Can we say amen to the reading of God's word? Amen. amen. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we thank you for your word that it is yes and amen. We gather this morning, Lord, to seek your face. Father, we come, Lord, to be sharpened, encouraged, rebuked. And we also come, Lord, to be corrected and to bring our worship before you. Father, as we humble ourselves before you, Spirit of God, we pray, may you be the one who speak, may you be the one who minister, and may you be the one who reveals Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. We declare, Lord, in this atmosphere that you'd be glorified. Every work that the enemy has intended, we declare that the power and the work of the enemy is null and void. And we pray that the word of God will accomplish its purpose in this moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the people of God says, Amen. Amen. Right, and I'm, 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 I'm titling this message this morning, The Tale of Two Queens. The Tale, tell your neighbor, we are talking about this morning, The Tale of Two Queens. Now Vashti, if you don't know anything about Vashti, 
Vashti was an extraordinary beautiful woman. Ah, it's Women's Month. The intention was never to speak on women because it's Women's Month. But what a joy for the woman. <laughs> but Vashti, an extraordinary beautiful woman, a Persian princess by birth. So Vashti was very familiar with royal customs, the royal formalities. And she was in a class of her own. She was independent and a brilliant, brilliant woman. High standards she had. And now she finds herself at a feast alongside the king who had a mighty big empire, a massive empire. And he was, he was displaying his wealth and his power to all the nobles and the princes around that has come to, to watch what power and wealth this king had. And normally when, when the king does this, you'd have the queen by his side. But the king decided he wanted to become merry. And so we see when he, he wants to become merry, meaning that he had quite a bit of wine in becoming merry. And as he was becoming merry, he sent all Vashti to go and have her own banquet. And so what that really means in practice is, is that Vashti is now with the concubines. And the concubines are, are women in that particular royalty who is lower ranking in terms of the queen. And so we can understand now that Vashti is most likely upset because he's displaying his splendor to everyone and now she needs to go and hang out with the lower wives in terms of the ranking. So Vashti understood royal customs. She understood her rights. She understood her position even to the extent that Vashti then refused to come to the king. When he summoned her, so we've got to understand that there's a legal implication. When you are being summoned by the king, you have no right, even if you are the queen, to decline the summonsing of the king. But Vasi in that moment declines. And so it is important to note that even after, we can see seven eunuchs went, so there was most likely some consultation. Vashti, just reconsider. Vashti, we're dealing with the king here. Vashti remains in the state of refusing. And then there was some counsel and whispering into the ears of the king, and then the king decided, well, we are divorcing Vashti. And Vashti no longer is Vashti the queen. And then on the scene that steps within year about Esther, that steps into the scene, the king now looks for a new queen, a fresh queen. I'm not encouraging any men here to look for fresh queens. This, this is this, any single man, this is not an encouragement to, to get second, third queens. You stay with your one queen, amen? <laughs> but we see that Esther now steps onto the scene. And the first thing that I want to talk about is she now needs to step into the shadow of Vashti. Because Vashti has already created some form of precedence, some form of leadership, some form of adoration. And now Esther, who is an orphan, is being reared now as a queen. But can you imagine stepping in someone else's shadow? Stepping into someone else's shadow can challenge you as an individual. If you're walking in someone else's shadow, it can make you feel less important. It can make you feel less in terms of your worth. It can make you feel less in terms of just what you are able to bring. But we see that Esther comes onto the scene as Esther. But we also notice, you know, that we can easily in our own lives live in the shadow of many other things. We can live in the shadow of the expectation of our parents. We can live in the shadow of our siblings. Because if you grow up with siblings, one may achieve better than the other. Perhaps in sport, perhaps in academics, perhaps in just the way they look. And now you're living in that one shadow. And you feel like I am less important. I am not noticed. I am insignificant. Or sometimes even in our childhood, we can live in the shadow of our childhood, even though we are grown adults. We can still go back to the time where something happened and we can live in that shadow of our childhood. And living in the shadow makes us feel hidden. It makes us feel that we are not important or not enough. So think about this. Think about a big tree that soaks up all the sun. And if you plant a seed in the dirt right next to the big tree, in a place where there is no sun, that seed is going to have a hard time growing up, reaching its full potential. So if you like, you're in the shadow 
of someone else. You feel like you can't be the best version of yourself. You see, under healthy leadership, no matter what the shadow may have been in your life, healthy leadership unlocks all that you are meant to be. And so we see that even when Esther reaches the platform or comes onto the scene, she's not trying to be a Vashti. She's not trying to mimic or imitate a Vashti. She's not trying to run from the shadow of Vashti. No, Esther is Esther. She comes with her own shadow. She comes being content and she comes with her own beauty, satisfied with her own beauty. Can you look in the mirror and you're satisfied with your own beauty? Can you look into the mirror and you're satisfied with your own hair? I am. Why are you laughing? <laughs> satisfied with your own features. Satisfied with your own smile. Satisfied with your own character and personality. Are you happy to be in your own skin? Are you happy with what God has formed and created? Because bearing in mind you are created in His image. And if you're in His image, it is an insult to God if you are not happy with what He has designed. He has taken time to mold you. He has taken time to put you together. And so I encourage you to be happy just like Esther was content and confident. But I relate Esther's confidence and her just her comfort in her skin to her uncle Mordecai. Mordecai was a Jewish man who feared God. And I believe that Mordecai poured the word of God into Esther's life. So when Esther was growing, she was filled with the word. She was filled with who God is. And so we can indeed see that Mordecai modeled something very significant. He imparted the word of God into the life of one individual. And we can see how the story begins to unfold. The shadow of Vashti did not overshadow Esther. Are you, friends, challenged this morning with someone else's shadow in your life? If you sit still and think for a moment, are you challenged with a shadow that makes you feel less important, insignificant, and feel like you don't have worth? I want you to take a moment to really reflect on that because that's the shadow of Vashti, but Esther came with her own shadow in God. We didn't see the second part that we're looking at is, is the scheme of Haman. The scheme of Haman bringing a tactic of the enemy. And we see that Mordecai, the uncle of Esther, is now confronted with this gentleman called Haman. And, Gen and, and Haman is a council of a king. He's a prime minister. He is highly ranked and very wealthy. And he demands that you should bring honor to him. But Mordecai, who is a man of God, don't bow down unto Haman. But we've got to understand a bit here about Haman. Haman is part of the descendant and the bloodline of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the people that attacked the Israelite nation from the very beginning when they came out of Egypt. The whole issue of the Amalekites actually stemmed back. It stemmed back up until Esau. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And remember the birthright issue? The birthright between Esau and Jacob that Esau sold because he was hungry. He sold his birthright to Jacob and now the grandchild, because they were growing up, became unhappy that they didn't receive the birthright. And this developed into a descendant that had a big issue with the Israelite nation. And so we see even in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, that God instructed King Saul to wipe out all the Amalekites. That's how serious this was. But the attack wasn't just the Amalekites. The attack wasn't just Haman. The attack wasn't just the pride and the arrogance of Haman in that moment. The attack was literally an attack from Satan. 
It was literally an attack from Satan. It wasn't just an attack against Mordecai. It wasn't just an attack against Esther. It wasn't just an attack against the Israelite nation. No, the attack was literally against the purposes of God. It was literally against God himself. It was literally against the bloodline that the Lord our God was bringing through. The Jewish nation. So imagine if the Jewish nation was wiped out. It would have meant that the bloodline of Jesus Christ wouldn't be able to be fulfilled. So the enemy was all along after the bloodline. We know that the bloodline and the promise even started when he spoke to Abram. We know that it even started right there. And we read this very scripture very fondly. For God so loved the world that whosoever believe in his son, but that very scripture, for that to be fulfilled, it came under attack, under attack, and under attack. It was the enemy sending forth attacks against attacks, against attacks. But we've got to be like a Mordecai. We got to stand on the word of God, irrespective. Can we say amen? amen? We got to be like a Mordecai and know that we stand our ground in the word of God. Now, church, this morning, maybe, just maybe, the enemy sent a Haman into your life. And the enemy now is trying to bring an attack against what God is wanting to do in your life. The enemy is trying to bring an onslaught in your life. And you see that the enemy is trying and pushing and aggravating you to bow down. To do things that you know that is against the will of God. He's sending attacks to you as an individual. And I want you to stand like Mordecai stood. He stood his ground and what did God do? God fought on his behalf. You see, God will fight on your behalf but you've got to stand on his word you've got to stand and believe that his word is yes and amen now we notice that as the attack intensifies the favor of God with Esther also increases many times when we are under attack we only focus on the attack but I want to encourage you to focus on the favor Focus on the favor that is also increasing whilst there is an attack. I'm not saying that any of us will be exempted from an attack. We will be attacked because we're dealing with the real enemy. But as the attack intensifies, the favor of God we see also increases. This means, church, what is consuming us when we are attacked? What is consuming our thoughts? What is consuming our emotions? And what is consuming our focus when we are under attack? Because the reality is, whatever consumes us becomes our God. Whatever consumes us becomes our God. I want you to think for a moment, what is it that consumes you if you are facing an attack. Now we see that even as Esther's favor increases, know this, Esther was an orphan. Her parents passed on whilst being very young. So we can see it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what the past may be, God is able to use ordinary people. God is able to use ordinary people and do extraordinary things. Hallelujah! I want you to know that you may feel ordinary today, but the God that we serve is able to take an ordinary person and do extraordinary things. Yes, he's able to do extraordinary things. I want you to convince yourself this morning in your seat and say, Lord, you will do extraordinary things through me. Extraordinary things through me, oh Lord. Extraordinary things. My neighbor may think I'm ordinary, Lord, but I know that you will do extraordinary things through me, oh Lord. You see, now Esther is placed in a position where she is experiencing abundant blessings. 
She's experiencing blessings upon blessings. Doors are opening radically for her. God moves her now from being a commoner to being royalty. Her life now changes radically now. Are you able and ready to steward the next level of blessing in your life? Are you ready for the blessing that God has in store? We can see that as, as, as God is moving, yes, it's moving with abundance, it's moving with a flow, it's moving with greater measure of favor, but there's got to be a responsibility as well to steward what God blesses with. Her friendship circles begins to change. Her wealth status begins to change. Her authority and her power begins to change. She's now seated with great women and great men. But notice, notice this one thing. Esther doesn't forget where she came from. When Mordecai reached out to Esther, she didn't disregard Esther. She remembered the very person that sowed into her life. She remembered the very person that poured time, energy, wealth into her life. She remembered the person who made sacrifices. Sometimes when we're in the blessing, we forget. We forget about those who helped us. We forget about those who ministered to us. We forget about those who supported us and encouraged us when it was difficult, when it was hard, when we were unnoticed. Sometimes even we let the wealth and the position and our career and what we have achieved and what we're driving and what we have become, sometimes we allow that to change us. And now we don't want to be associated with those who's invested in us. I want to encourage you, sometimes it doesn't matter where the person may be that has sowed into your life. It doesn't matter where that person may be or how far that person has fallen. I encourage you, you be a blessing. You sow seeds of grace. You show the goodness of God. You step up and you say, this is the Lord my God. I will continue to be a blessing. So we see the shadow of Vashti. And we see the scheme of Haman, which is the attack of Satan. But we also see in the midst of all this, that God is in the business of setting things up. Setting things up for an appointed time. Setting things up for a time like this. Mordecai presents to Esther a choice to make. Recognize God's providence, he says to her. Recognize that you are placed in this position by divine order. Recognize that you are placed here by a divine pattern of God. Risk your life, Esther, and possibly even die by going to the king, not being summoned. So now we know Vashti was summoned, but Esther is not summoned. To be summoned or not to be summoned but we can see that Esther then knows as well that if she goes against being uninvited, it could potentially mean death for her. It could potentially mean that she loses her life. It could potentially mean the end of Esther. Perhaps in our own lives, we are faced with decisions to lay down certain things for the goodness of God. Lay down decisions and bring decisions before God, even if it feels as if we're going to lose everything. Esther may have lost everything in that moment. She's challenged and she steps out in obedience. We know that this moment that Esther was faced with, it was a divine moment. It was, I call it a kairos moment. It was a moment that was divinely orchestrated by God. There's, a, there's what we call a kairos moment and there's a chronos moment. So a chronos moment speaks of, you know, our chronological time. But this moment was a time that God has ordained for this moment for Esther to step in. But yet there was a responsibility for Esther to partner, to step in, and to obey and to step in all that God has intended for, for such a time like this. 
I wonder what you are facing right now. And I wonder just perhaps if you are understanding that you are called by divine order. That no matter where you may find yourself, that God has a divine pattern for your own life. That even where you may find yourself right now, it is by his divine appointment. Can you say amen? And we know that it is God, according to Ephesians, that works all things according to the counsel of His will. So nothing that is being accomplished is really our strength. It is Him that does it, but He calls us graciously to step in and to do what He calls us to do. And so now Esther is faced with a very difficult decision to go to the king, not being summoned into the courts of the king. We see the storyline here of the tale of two queens. We see Vashti being the first queen and we see Esther being the second queen. We need to watch out, church, for the second person. We need to watch out for the second person. The second person we generally see does greater things. Stay with me. The second person we gotta look out for. We see a Cain was the older brother, but it was Abel's offering that was accepted before the Lord. We see Ishmael, who was the biological heir, but it was Isaac who was the promised seed. We see Esau, who was a rightful heir, but we see the bloodline of the Messiah came through Jacob. We see the Israelite nation was characterized as well by a first generation and a second generation. The first generation was under sin and judgment. The second was under promise and fulfillment. We see the prodigal son being the younger one, the second one, the brother was the older. It was the prodigal son, the younger one, who stepped into the promises of God. We see Adam was the first man, and we see Christ was the second man. Are you with me? Esther was a foreshadow of the second person. If you are in Christ, friends, if you are in Christ, you are operating in the second person. You are operating in Christ. The person, the first person dies to the flesh. The first person dies to the flesh. The first person dies to the flesh. And the second person lives in Christ. Lives in the fulfillment. Lives in the promise. Lives in all what God had in store. I declare over your life this morning, greater things, greater things will be done in and through you for the glory of God, because you are in the second person, because you are in the second person. Vashti was the first person. She was more concerned about her beauty and about being independent and about her self-respect and her character, her high standards. And even though whilst that is important, she was self-centered in the moment. Esther, Esther was concerned about the glory of God was concerned about the people of God, was concerned about the mission of God, was concerned about the call of God. Esther was not summoned, but she went into the courts of the king, not by her own order, but she went into the king's court under the rulership and under the authority of the king of kings who was greater than that very king in that moment. She stood before a king knowing that she is serving a greater king. Esther's actions, I'm going to call up the worship team to join me. Esther's actions, church, about to close, was saying, it is no longer I that live. It is no longer I that live, but Christ, the Spirit of God that is now within me. Esther's actions when going to the courts of the king and knowing that she could potentially die. Her actions were saying, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. Her actions were saying that if I deny myself and I take up all that God has called me to be, I would be able to live again. Some of you, are still living in the shadow of a Vashti. I'm here to tell you Psalm 91 speaks about a different shadow. It says to us, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know, there's a shadow that can lift you out. There's a shadow that can unlock your destiny. There's a shadow that can break the shadow of a Vashti over your life. There's a shadow that God says, I can cover you irrespective. I know someone's been giving you a hard time as I've been praying. Someone's been giving you a hard time to the extent that you are stressed, to the extent that you cannot have sleep, to the extent that you feel like, how do I address this person? No weapon, you tell the devil, no weapon that is formed against me would be able to prosper. Because I am in the second person. I am in Christ. I am in Christ. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? The enemy sent a Haman to kill and abort what God had started in you. Just like he attempted to kill the bloodline, he's attempting to abort the destiny that God has for your life. But I want you to be saying this morning, if God is for me, if God is for me, I, I know the enemy is attacking, but if God is for me, if God is for me, who can be against me? Greater is he, the second one, who is within me than he that is within the world. I'm saying to you, friends, you are more than a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror in Christ because he is the second person. He is the second person. Oh, glory. I sensed that the Lord wanted you to praise your way out of the shadow of Vashti. The Lord wants you to praise your way out of the attack of the enemy. The Lord wants you to praise to praise come on praise
God's gonna work it out. God's gonna fight on your behalf. Give him your best praise. I say focus your energy on him and give him your praise. Give him your praise. Give him your praise. Hallelujah. 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 I give you my praise. I give you my praise. I give you my praise. I give it to you, Lord. All my praise. I give it to you. My praise. I give it to you. My praise. Glory. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here's a shout of praise in the house. Here's a shout of freedom in this house. Oh, Lord. Shandarabashende. Rokoba sandarabababababai. Hikorabababababashandai. Rinterebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebebeb
more time. I won't be silent, but I'll praise him. Come on, Ben, let's do this one more time. in our sin and even though we lost in our sin he calls us and he adopts us through the blood through the blood that he shed on the cross and he wants to call you his child if you are in this place today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this will be a great opportunity for you to respond to step into the second person, to step into the promises, to step into all that God has destined and purposed for you. If that is you, I'm closing out the service. Please come to the front and I will pray with you. I will lead you in a time of prayer and encourage you about the decision of responding to the gospel. In Jesus' name. Raise your hands as we receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you. May you walk in the fullness of what God has in store for you. May you know that you are called, set apart for a time like this. May you know that no weapon that is formed against you would be able to prosper because you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Give him another praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I release you to have a blessed Sunday.